and we are live on Facebook. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Phil Brown. My name is Stephen Herder. I'm one of the co-founders of ITDI, and we'd like to welcome you to this very special, really, really morning, afternoon, evening. Hey, we're all around the globe right now. Indeed. Uh, so if you'd like to say hi in the chat, please do so. Uh, let us know where you're watching from. That'd be fantastic. Uh, we're delighted to have you here to join us for our first ever ITDI panel discussion on great minds in language education. Mm -hmm. And we're thrilled to be joined here today with Scott Thrombu, Dorothy Zemak, and Kevin Ryan. And today I will give a brief overview of what's going to be happening so that everyone knows where we're going over the next hour. And then um, Steve will give a brief introduction to Gmail before we put each of our guests on the hotspot for a little while. Okay, uh, so basically, first of all, we, uh, in today's session, we'll be moving on to give each of our guests a chance to share and answer some of those questions we posted earlier in the week about their courses and the books that they've chosen with the great minds that have inspired and intrigued us. And then we will also move on to the end. Uh, we will actually be inviting you with a special invitation to join us for a meet and greet where you get a chance to meet uh, Scott, Dorothy, Kevin and Stephen, ask them questions and so on in breakout rooms uh, in Zoom here with us. And of course, as always, please feel free to add any comments into the chat and ask questions and we will take those and pass them on also. We already have 35 people in the room. We've got lots of nice introductions and hi. Please tell us where you're coming from, everybody. It's always nice to know. Thank you. Fantastic. So I'm going to hand over to Steve just for a few minutes. And I'd like to give Steve a chance to introduce the Great Minds in Language Education courses. Yes, I'm very excited to do that. The genesis for this idea uh, began about 13 years ago uh, through a Skype study group when I was doing my own MA in, in uh, TEFL and TESOL. Um, thinking about this, I, I realized that that experience I had uh, working with other teachers uh, going through all of these MA readings we had to do was one of the best learning experiences in my life. Uh, basically, the MA TEFL, for, for those of you, we went, both Phil and I went through University of Birmingham. Uh, you had two or three months of reading, and then you had to produce uh, like a 4,000 word essay uh, six times throughout uh, before you got to your dissertation. Um, the first module I did, I did by myself, and it was a horribly lonely experience. Uh, I was full of readings. I spoke to my wife and my coworker, uh, a British woman, and both of them uh, were completely sick of listening to me. My wife in one day and my coworker in about a week just looked at me and said, can you please stop talking about all this, these readings? Uh, but so I went and I, I created a Skype study group and Skype was pretty new at the time. And there were basically five of us and we met every single Monday night for three years. And we basically uh, became best friends. We, we went through all the materials that we, we worked on. We even came up with nicknames for each other. Uh, Kirsten became Shakespeare because of the prolific nature of her writing in our uh, bulletin board. Uh, Joshua named himself Satan because <laughs> he was so critical of everything we were reading and he always brought up the other side. Uh, Mark was Einstein, and sometimes we had no clue what he was talking about, and sometimes he was completely brilliant. Um, Anthony became the professor because he had just a very British academic way of speaking and, and sharing things, and they named me Mother Hen. <laughs> and it wasn't, it wasn't nearly as glorious as all those other monikers, but I ended up organizing the whole thing, setting reading lists, making sure the, the Skype group was working, and facilitating the, meaning, the meetings. 
I want to tell you why it was so significant in just, just a few words. But the, the Monday nights became like date night. And that, that date was a little acronym. That D was debate. We really got into debating each other. When we had to do uh, uh, papers, we had to go on the hot seat and explain the outline of our paper. Um, a was apply. We talked about how can we apply some of this to our actual teaching in our, in our contexts. T was teach. And one of the, the best ideas was that every week we chose a different person to lead the session. And so we all know by teaching things, that's one of the best ways to learn things. And finally, E was elicit questions. And we, we put a real focus on asking people why. Why is this theoretically uh, significant? Why are we doing this? Why are we not doing such and such? So that experience was, like I said, one of the best experiences I've had. A number of months ago, I contacted Kevin Ryan and pitched this idea for ITDI to come up with this new course because Kevin's been, um, maybe unbeknownst to him, one of my role models for many years. Uh, Kevin's got maybe five or seven years more experience teaching in Japan, but I'm amazed at the width of his knowledge as well as the depth of his knowledge and how generous he is to share everything he knows. Uh, Kevin was in on the idea and said, yeah, let's try it. It's new, it's innovative, let's give it a shot. We then contacted Scott and everybody knows, everybody in ELT loves being in the same room with Scott. Uh, beyond your expertise, your, your natural friendly ability to work with people, uh, we just filled, we just had over a hundred teachers come into our Dogma ELT courses over the past six months. And then finally, we contacted Dorothy. And I know how busy Dorothy is doing a, a thousand and one things, but I had the pleasure of working with her over four different ITDI courses and realized how, uh, I, I meant to say, and watching her plenaries before I really know her, knew her very well, and just how uh, experienced and in touch with teachers that she was. So finally, I just wanted to say that the reason that the four of us are, are doing this, I call it the three excellent E's, the uh, experience that they bring in both teaching and training, the expertise they all have in teaching and learning, and final E is empathy that they have towards other teachers and how kind and generous they are to work with teachers. So that's basically, we came up with this G mile. Many of us spend time saying, no, we are not the great minds. We are talking about the, <laughs> about great, the minds, great minds, talking about the book. So please, uh, uh, we've shortened it to either G mile. Some people think, are you saying G mail? No, it's G mile or great minds. So we're very excited to have you all here. That's just a little introduction to this course. Phil. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, so um, with that, I would like to then lead in and bring Scott Thornbury, who will be first up of our four guests today. And oh, as you all know, uh, Scott Thornbury is a prolific teacher and teacher educator for over 40 years now, um, with a career spanning Egypt, UK, Spain, New Zealand, and internationally. He's an acclaimed author and presenter, and he's also academic director for ITDI uh, TESOL certificate course. And I won't go into a long um, introduction because you can also find his, uh, his biography on his page. So I'd like to move in and welcome Scott. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Stephen. Um, thank you, co-panelists for being here. I'm speaking to you from Spain, where it's uh, just after eight in the morning. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure to kick this off. Uh, I think it's a great idea, and I concur with Stephen's experience of uh, reading groups. I've had some experience myself, uh, and I think that the way that this has been put together is really exemplary. My, the great mind that I've chosen uh, is Earl Stevick, uh, who was, unfortunately, uh, has passed away a few years ago, 
that was a formative influence on me. Uh, one reason being uh, that about four or five years into teaching, I first discovered his book, uh, A Way and Ways, or learning or teaching languages, A Way and Ways. And it was the first book I ever read about uh, language teaching. I'm ashamed to say, it didn't seem at the time. Uh, I was learning so much in the classroom, I didn't need to reinforce that with reading, but I, I, it, it blew my mind away. It was really such an exciting experience. And it was the book I needed to read at the time. Uh, and I've been forever grateful for that experience. And of course, I've read subsequently uh, other books and articles by him over the years. So when um, I was invited to contribute to this anthology or this homage to Earl Stevick, uh, edited, co-edited by my dear good friend in Seville, Jane Arnold, who I hope is, is here in the room, she and is, Tim Murphy, another dear good friend in Japan, they asked me to uh, if I had a contribution to make which was consistent with the Earl Stevick's kind of worldview beliefs about uh, education and language education specifically. Uh, and I, I was very grateful to be able to accept that offer. And so the book, as I say, is a collection of articles uh, that are all linked by having the one uh, great mind as their kind of inspiration, the great mind being Earl Stevick. And I'm very pleased to say that Earl Stevick did actually get to see a copy of the book before, uh, sadly, he passed away in about 2013 or so. Mm. So that's the, that's the book <clears throat> that we'll be using. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for sharing that, Scott. It's great to hear the backstory behind your book choice as well. And um, earlier in the week, uh, as some people have seen already, you also shared uh, one of your favorite quotes, which I'll just pull up on screen now. Does everybody see that? Okay, and uh, I'd like to ask you as well um, to tell us a little bit more about uh, this quote that you chose. Well, this is, it's a kind of, um, it comes from the article that I wrote for the, or uh, the chapter I wrote for the book, which uh, is about, I mean, very briefly, it's about embodied, what we call, what is called embodied cognition, the notion that learning is not simply a cognitive capacity, but it involves the whole physical body and the body itself is situated in its context. So it's a kind of, it's a broader view of what learning is and what language learning is. It's a contextualized or situated view or an ecological view, if you, if you like. Mm. Uh, and uh, this quote uh, from an article co-written uh, that came out a few years ago in Modern Language Journal captures to me this sort of embeddedness of the different uh, levels in which language use takes place and therefore which language learning uh, takes place. And I like it particularly because serendipitously it uses the collocation meaningful action and meaningful action is the name, is the title of the book, in fact, that we'll be using. But as I say, it captures something of uh, the spirit of not just my article, uh, but the book itself. And I think it's a, this is a kind of a sentiment that Earl Stevick himself would have wholly supported because you know, his, his view of learning as being not purely an intellectual capacity, but more holistic involving the, the, the whole person, their emotions, as well as their intellect uh, is supported and captured, I think quite nicely in this quote. Yes, and I think that resonates with all of us, especially you know, just as we try to ensure we have that meaningful action in our classroom with our learners, then also on our teacher development, then we have that meaningful action that also Steve was talking about right through from his MA days to this, these GMAR courses that we have here. Um, so Scott, would you kindly tell us a little more about what you think teachers can get from your GMAR course? Well, I mean, because it's a collection of chapters by different writers on different topics, as I say, linked by the common um, allegiance to Earl Stevick's work, there's uh, a great variety of topics are covered uh, in, the, in the book, including motivation, memory, um, complex learning or systems theory, embodied co cognition, uh, um, what else? Uh, narrative research, etc. So there's a, a great deal of variety. Mm. Uh, and 
it's uh, not just because the books are linked to the name of uh, the the articles are linked to the name of Earl Stevick, because but that many of the writers themselves are, are, are great minds in the uh, field. I'm thinking of people like Diane Larson Freeman, uh, Leo Van Leer, and so on. So uh, there's uh, these are in their own right these are great chapters to read, and I think they thread together to make a really interesting course. So I think the idea is that we will um, critically read these articles and uh, study them and talk about them in, in considerable depth, but also uh, following the precedent that Stephen was describing, we will think about how the principles in these chapters can be applied to classroom practice. Uh, and also we will try to link them to other um, other articles, papers, research that's in the literature uh, to expand outwards from these very punchy, readable, and I stress that they are very readable. These are not written for uh, academic journals, these articles. These are written for a wide readership. Uh, and that I think will be form the basis of a, of a really interesting extended critical discussion. Absolutely. Um, I think that accessibility is really key for a lot of people as well. And um, just lastly, um, would you like to share a little bit on how you would like to approach your course? Well, I've selected, uh, it's a, an eight um, session course over eight weeks. I've selected seven of the chapters of the 14 or so in the book, and that was a tough call. Um, so each session will focus on one of these chapters, which um, the participants will obviously read in advance. There'll be preset questions to focus the discussion, uh, but it won't just be discussion. I'd also like to have input during the sessions, which will either come from myself or from volunteers in the group. So a sort of 10 minute presentation related to the theme of the chapter to precipitate further uh, discussion. And then there will be a follow up uh, asynchronous discussion on a, on a forum over the week prior to the next session. I've left the eighth session free uh, so that the participants on the course can, between them, vote for the one and uh, one other article that they would like uh, to read to, to, to round the whole thing off. That's more or less how I envisage the course running. That sounds like democracy in action. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Scott. I uh, really appreciate you taking time to be here and to share all of that with our audience. Uh, Steve, just to check in with you, if there are any comments or questions from the Facebook. That no, it's just, uh, it's like a love-in. There are just so many happy people in the audience, uh, comments. Uh, Maria in Ukraine says that uh, this idea of what Scott's talking about resonates so much, this kind of holistic approach, including emotions, not only intellect. Uh, Amir says uh, very much related to the uh, social emotional learning, you know, so people are listening carefully, adding in their comments, and we hope they'll uh, jump in when you share a link later where we're going to open up the whole Zoom room and have people come in and join us here. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, yes, we will share a link to um, the courses. They're also in the description of the event today. Great. Okay. And uh, the numbers are growing. People are not leaving us. We're up to 53, 56. Uh, right now, that's excellent having so many people. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> jazz hands. <laughs> and, and yeah, and if you're watching as well, please feel free to like and share this as well whilst it's live. If you have other friends, colleagues that you know would be interested and not wish to miss out. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Scott. And we shall move on to our second guest today, who is Kevin Ryan. Hi. Yes, welcome to be here. It's really an honor to be here because uh, I'm probably the least famous of any of you. Ah. <laughs> uh, so let me just introduce uh, Kevin just a, a little bit. Um, Kevin Ryan is a professor at Showa Women's University in Tokyo, Japan, and he's 
taught in actually in Barcelona, Chicago, Nanking, and then 35 years in Tokyo, both at the graduate and postgraduate or undergraduate, graduate, postgraduate levels. And Kevin, you've been um, very involved in kind of cool research and also right. in the Japan Association for Language Teaching right. in various roles. Mm -hmm. And we also know that you've been the last few years pre-COVID, then you've also been doing teacher training in Myanmar. That's mm. correct. Yeah. And uh, with ITDI and the ITDI community as well, we've uh, been lucky to have you increasingly involved, especially with contributions to the recent Dogma ELT group that has been set up. And your contributions are always really widely respected and appreciated. So thank great you. Great to have you. Yes. Sorry, there's a couple of uh, people in the audience arguing that Kevin is in fact famous to them. Okay, well, <laughs> good to know. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, yes, Kevin, um, first of all, um, would like to know as well from, from you, as with Scott, then why did you choose your Great Minds in Language Education book on TPLT? Okay, well, uh, my career has kind of been TBLT adjacent uh, for a long time. I teach courses in vocabulary acquisition and psycholinguistics and methods and materials and teaching with technology, a little bit all over the place, but it's never specifically. And as you said, I've been involved with CALL a lot and SLA and some intercultural communication. I've even taken a couple of ITDI courses, one from Dorothy here, and about uh, publishing eBooks and uh, the other dogma course from Scott. That's uh, really where uh, I got noticed, I think, by Stephen. In any case, uh, Stephen came to me last December and this TBLT question has been nagging me for years and years because I really don't have a good handle with it. I come to, to a task and I'm like a blind man and I feel like, Sometimes it's a wall and sometimes it's a rope and sometimes it's like a tree trunk. And, uh, and I never really got a good handle. And I thought, well, the best way to learn about this is to teach it. And uh, found this TBLT book that had just come out last year uh, with Ellis and Peter Skihan, uh, Shintani, Lee, uh, and one other. And uh, it was a really great book because it has five different perspectives, right. uh, cognitive interactionist, what they call psycholinguistic, uh -huh. and you've got sociocultural with Dornier and people like that, psychological, and finally educational. So that really takes care of this blind man problem with uh, five different aspects because it looks at all of the, the tasks uh, from a different, different perspectives. It's not a how to teach book, but it does give you a really solid background on what is a task and how to use tasks. And later I'll talk about theory and practice. Excellent. And thank you very much for that background into the choice of book. And of course, TPLT is a really uh, popular topic and an area of teaching and teaching approach with communicative approach. So it's something that we often see a great interest amongst the ITDI community and teachers worldwide. And I'm just going to share the quote that you also um, put out earlier this week, and we've been sharing around. And you see that up on screen? I do, I do. Okay. And I'd like you to tell us a little bit and our audience members some more about it. Okay. Well, uh, this is a quote, and it uh, has shows 17 different definitions of a task. And if you go back to the book in 2006, it lists you know, different authors and each one has their own definition of what is a task. And um, the book from 2006, if you can actually take the quote off and uh, I'll show you on the screen here, mm -hmm. or maybe you can see both. There yeah. we go. This is the 2006 book and this is the, the one we'll be using. And a very, almost the same uh, format. Now you'll notice the thickness, uh, the second one is a lot thicker. They have more definitions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the nice thing about it is you start to get they, the definitions starting to align and coalesce and get together. So you, you're starting to get a much better idea. So over the 15 years, there have been advances and uh, really 
it, it kind of demonstrates that. So, you know, my, I, I read the book three times to prepare for the course. Uh, first reading, I read just like a participant to do highlighting. Second read, I do a deep dive, go in, there's a 45 page bibliography. So I just have to pick out a few of the one, the best ones and, and read some of those. And then the third reading I do as a teacher and build the course around that. So uh, it uh, gets at the central question of the quest. What is a task? Yes, and uh, you've been sharing your approach to developing this course on your blog. Um, and I, I must admit myself and others, I was blown away by um, reading about your approach and you, um, how you kind of go about doing those three readings. And I think that's really insightful for anybody else who's also developing their own course or thinking about how they go about um, preparing for new courses. Uh, so it's right. great to Easy to find too, kevinryan.com. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and some people may have also seen and have seen the posts that we've shared with the link to that blog as well, but we'll put the link in later too. So thank you. Uh, thirdly, then, uh, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about what you think teachers can get from your Gmail course. Well, a lot depends on who's going to participate. And, and I don't call them students or participants. Um, uh, there's a ratchet between theory and practice. And there's a kind of a bridge between those two. And uh, depending on who's in the course, we can uh, go one way or the other. There's uh, 12 chapters in the book, which is too much. But I, what I'm going to do is prepare all 12 chapters and we'll pick out probably eight of those uh, and uh, stick to those. And depending on how much uh, you wanna do uh, theory or practice, uh, that'll be in there. Uh, also, we'll have a burning question for each week. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, what is a task? Uh, what is, or how do you do corrective feedback correctly? Uh, motivation, things like that. Another possible way to organize the course is focus on the authors. I mean, these are the great minds like Ellis and Skian, Shintani, Lee, and then other people that come in quite a bit like Robinson, Lantoff, Dornier, and all of the others. And uh, so a lot, see what I do is just prepare and put it out there. And usually the first week or, or even before the first week, try to decide what, which of these uh, are the most useful. It sounds very co-constructed, hey, Kevin? Right. Yeah. Right. And that's giving the, um, the power to the teachers in your group to, um, to get more ownership or um, uh, involvement. Yes. And we know from um, interacting with you as well in the Dogma ELT group and how you take a very supportive and, you know, a very um, thoughtful role to you uh, as a facilitator in the group and also add and bring people together. So I'm looking forward to that very much. I've been a facilitator of groups for more than 30 years online, the original JALT group, for example. Yeah. Fantastic. And um, so you've also told us as well, including your last answer, how you plan to approach your course. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add to that? Well, just a, a real quick one, it, uh, two approaches for a grad seminar where everybody sits around a round table. I'm not a leader. I'm just a facilitator. I lay the groundwork. Another one is I've been trying to do with uh, some, my grad school courses are really small. Uh, so there's more of a, a, a conversation, not really a discussion, but uh, there's a podcast, a movie podcast called The Rewatchables. Mm -hmm. And it's about classic movies. And these three or four or five guys sit around the table and they, they get really excited. It's not analytical. It's not, uh, uh, they don't keep things at arm's length. Uh, they have, there's a format that they follow. They have things like Apex Mountain. Mm -hmm. The Apex Mountain is like, is this movie the, the best movie of the actor's career? And they go through all of the actors. Does it stand the test of time? the movie, each of the roles and the characters, stuff like that. But it follows this format and that's what I want to do. So I tell the students to bring three things to each class. Uh, one thing that they really agree with, one thing they're surprised with, and one thing they're kind of questionable about. And we try to take care of the first one online beforehand and the second one surprising stuff in the, in the actual live session and then the questionable stuff afterwards. Mm, that's a nice approach to blended learning. Mm. Okay, and um, 
so that's uh, four questions for you, Kevin. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. And if there's any other comments or questions that you have in the audience, then please do let us know. Feel free to add them there. If you're still thinking about it in the audience, then that's okay too. You also have a chance to speak to Kevin uh, after the Facebook Live if you'd like to. We've got a comment from Bistra. Hey, Kevin, one of oh, our, Bistra, one yes. of our uh, wonderful from uh, Italy. Yeah. teammates from Italy. And uh, this sounds really interesting. Um, I'm just feeling as uh, Scott and Kevin have now finished their little thing, the pressure is feeling bigger and bigger, thinking, oh, my God, I'm, am I going to ever be able to read my book three times? <laughs> <laughs> Not required. Not no, I know. It's, I'm a I slow just, learner. I'm in awe, Kevin. I love how you think. It's always different from the way I think, but I just love being in a group with people I respect and seeing, seeing how different ideas rise to the top. So we're up to 64 people in the room right now. That's great. Fantastic. Okay. And so third, we are very happy to bring uh, Dorothy Zemak with us here today. And I will just bring you up onto our main screen here. If you can just bear with me a moment. You're being pinned, Dorothy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> been practicing this wrestling move all week hopefully you'll be pinned in just a few seconds i've pinned myself first i think though. <laughs> you did <laughs> okay um so dorothy zima she's been teaching for 30 plus years and in teacher education uh she's been in materials writing for a very long time as well uh with most of the top publishers that you could ever think of and then in 2012, almost 10 years ago now, you also uh, founded Waze Goose Press uh, as well. And uh, as Kevin mentioned earlier, we're delighted to have had you for the last few years with uh, the ITDL's course on self-publishing for ELT professionals. So welcome, Dorothy. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And so, yes, first of all, we'd also like to know from you about uh, the book that you chose for your great minds in language education. And, and how did I choose it? I, I didn't judge it by its, its cover, but I, I, I did choose it for its title. I actually chose the book before I'd read it, be, before it had been published. I saw the title go by when I was approached with this course. I thought, oh, man, that's, that's probably the book I wanted. But I, I had also just... Um, I, 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 do you have on the screen? Can you show the book or can I show the book? Okay. Yes. The English, yes, the English for 21st century skills. And I had just seen one of the editors, Sophia Mavridi, uh, present at a, at a conference and she was great. And so I looked at the, the chapters and the list of contributors. And on the basis of that, I, I ordered the, well, first, first I told you I was going to use that book and then I ordered it. And, and fortunately it was a good book. Um, but I've, I've been, when I've been doing teacher training in the last year, two years, I've been working on projects that, that come down from ministries and sort of governmental organizations, and they're, they're heavy on large frameworks like you know, Bloom's Taxonomy and the four C's and 21st mm. century skills. And everybody is, is so energized by these frameworks and these labels. But when you kind of dig down it's like okay well that there's there's bloom's taxonomy and that looks lovely what does that look like in the classroom mm. and people kind of blink and they say well you have there are these different levels of tasks and i said oh yes absolutely so in the classroom where you're using this kind of required rather dull textbook how are you bringing that in and they have no idea so i'd like to look at 21st century skills of, of course to to understand them and there's you know a lot of discussion in this book which which has four separate introductions it has a preface a foreword a preamble and an introduction a mm. lot of people are introducing <laughs> the two main sections of the book which are fundamental 21st century skills and then advanced 21st century skills so there's obviously some discussion of you know are there 21st century skills spoiler mm. yes but but what how does that inform teaching and what does it actually look like and I would I would love to spend some time with other you know practitioners you know talking about what are, what are the once we know these things and once we understand these things what do we actually do in a in a 45 minute session with a bunch of middle school students 
you know, in this in this classroom. And and so that's what I what I would like to explore. And I when I started reading it, I think it's it's not, I mean, it's called English for 21st century skills. It's more the other way. It's more sort of 21st century skills for English and how that how that you know reacts with with language instruction. And there's there's some there's some great stuff in there. I'm I'm excited by my book. <laughs> yeah, we are too. And I think you know that's you know really important point you hit upon is you know how do we take what we pick up in teacher development, teacher education, and training and actually apply it into our classrooms so that. We also have, you know, uh, research informed teaching and also research uh, that is informed by teaching the other way as yeah. well. Yeah. Okay. And from there, I'd like to share the quote that we posted from you during the week. Uh, I, I, I couldn't pick one. Sorry. <laughs> I picked two. Uh, sorry, one, but, uh, one from one of the chapters and one from one of these these four different introduction yes, things. They nicely lead together. Uh, so I'll just give audience members a chance to take a look and read what's on screen. And would you like to also tell us about why you chose these? Um, yeah, for that, th that first quote comes from one of these four <laughs> preambles or introductions around the question of, are there actually such things as 21st century skills or are those new labels to things we've, we've always been doing? But mm. as we are now, wholly online and I think even going forward partially online mm. things have changed it is not the same kind of classroom that I was teaching in in the 80s or the 90s or three years ago and I, I see that in the way I interact with with friends with family with with students with teachers I see the way people of different generations and and you know technological expertise of different countries and different cultures. And there are new ways to, to communicate. And that does have implications for our classroom. And I, and I love that, that more specific quote, that the second one that's, that talks about students as creators instead yeah. of just consumers. So that when we give students language, it's not just for them to show facility with, with you know, speaking fluently for two minutes on the topic is that we want them to have something to say and to contribute to their communities and to their countries and to the globe. Um, I mean, most people aren't learning English to talk to their immediate circles. They're using their native languages to do that. They're learning English to talk globally and, and to connect. And so they should have something to say rather than just you know the knowledge of how to say it, and and I, I thought it was it was nice to to recognize the importance of students in in this. Yes, and I really like that. I think the thought of you know making sure we're thinking about taking that beyond the classroom for them as well, and getting them to do so. And so, what I'd like to also move on to is uh, what you think that teachers or what you hope teachers can get from your Gmail course. Well, I, I, I would love, I mean, like, like Scott mentioned, I have a lot of different chapters by different people on different topics, some of which are, you know, we could chunk together and, and, and some not. So if we could put different people in charge of certain areas for certain class sessions and maybe do a little outside the book research as well, bring in ideas, we can discuss what does it mean, what are the implications, but I'd like to get really, really specific so someone could say, this is the lesson that I am teaching this week. Here's what this idea or these principles would look like in my class. Here's what I would do differently now that I know this. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the more different contexts we have teachers from, the more examples we'll get from that. And I mean, I, I do see books that say, well, instead of saying it like this, you could do this, but that's still somebody else's theoretical example. So I'm hoping teachers will bring in their actual lesson plans, their books, their ideas, their contexts, or if they're not currently teaching, you know, something that they can, you know, remember or something that they hope to do. And we can get really, really specific. So we know exactly what these ideas will look like put into practice. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Dorothy. And uh, you've touched on as well on how you, partly how you plan to approach the course. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to that? Um, no, <laughs> okay. um, I, you know, take turns 
leading the discussion and and eliciting but but I don't want it to be, you know, one or two people lecturing and everyone else going, hmm, I mean, we should all dig in and dissect and question and, and, you know, have done the reading in advance. But if someone's in charge of leading it and could, you know, maybe draw, draw in outside, you know, even outside the book, other people, you know, who are also key voices on those topics and bring yes, in another article or a video or, or an opposing viewpoint or something. That's something I noticed in the courses we did that uh, Dorothy did, and I was acting as a host in a very small way. That just how engaging and practical seem to be two words that really focus on the way you approach uh, your training, and and uh, we just hear over and over again the 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 satisfaction that people have who have a chance to work with you over a period of time. So. We're hoping, uh, well, we not even hoping, we know that's what they're going to get from spending eight sessions yeah. with you. That's what you do. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dorothy. Uh -huh. uh, I think one of the common themes that has emerged in through a lot of the teacher development and the way we look at teacher development education, you know, it's really not about uh, being the sage on the stage, but really looking at the guide on the side and how we facilitate each person's including our own professional development and draw from each other because there's always such a rich um, body of experience and knowledge in the room together yeah okay and last of all but not least i'd like to bring Stephen into the room or oh, well he's in the room already but i'm going to pin you as well and unpin dorothy it doesn't hurt dorothy does it not at all. Okay. Excellent. And so uh, just briefly introduce Stephen. Many of you are uh, familiar with Stephen's face, who's joined me on mostly a monthly basis with our ITDI roundups. Uh, Stephen has been teaching for over 30 years in Japan in the elementary, high school, university, as well as private language schools in his early career. And he's long been involved in teacher development in many different innovative ways, uh, from co-founding MASH Collaboration with myself and Mark DeBoer from that study group years back, to also looking and then found, finding other ways to develop professionally, and then co-founding ITDI, where he is, of course, director, uh, sorry, where he's director as well as co-founder. So welcome, Steve. Thank you, Phil. And so for yourself as well, I would like to hear from you why you chose your Great Minds in Language Education book and tell us a little about it. So this is my book, uh, Visible Learning for Teachers by John Hattie. Uh, this is a follow up book, actually, to the original book called Visible Learning. Um, so the reason that I chose this book is uh, on the back cover. It's not my quote, but it, it says uh, reveals teachings holy grail and that kind of caught my eye uh, everybody wants to find the holy grail in whatever they're doing but um i um the first reason i chose this book is that i, I have this uh, personal philosophy as a teacher that being a teacher means uh having a never-ending commitment to learning uh, I had possibly the world's most boring history teacher when I walked into high school first year. And at the end of the class, I found out that, in fact, I would have him for three years. And, uh, and so when I started teaching in Japan, I promised myself that even if I have to go back and flip burgers, if I ever stop learning, that I will stop teaching. So that's part of that's that's one of the initial reasons. Um, I, I basically always, my part of my teaching philosophy is I, I never try to be perfect, but I try to get better. And every year we try something new, and if it bombs, we, we throw it away, and if it works okay, and we, we reflect on how to make it better, we try it again next year in a different way. Um, uh, selfishly, um, there's so much in this book, I can't even sort through it all. And so I feel like I need help 
sorting through it with a, a number of other teachers, because like listening to Kevin earlier, his ideas are always different from mine, but they're always great. And I, I try to pick up what I can from them. Um, the same way I've learned from Scott and Dorothy over sitting, sitting in ITDI courses, you know, multiple times, I'm constantly learning from other people that I respect. Um, finally, the reason I chose this book and not the visible learning book uh, was that the, the visible learning book is quite research heavy. It's uh, John Hattie's um, synthesis of over 800 different uh, pieces of research that he put together. And so obviously he created this book uh, with a focus on teachers. And so that's, that's the, the main four reasons that I chose visible learning for teachers. Back oh, to you, Phil. This is very right. funny for us to be in this relationship. We've never, back to you, Phil. <laughs> yeah, we have a slight role reversal since usually doing the hosting and I'm in the, I'm on bass or keys in the background. And I'd like to share the quote that you've picked as well. And you can tell us a little more about that. Uh, so for the benefit of everybody here as well. Yeah, so just quickly, Visible Learning is the definitive book on sorting out the effectiveness of teaching strategies, a must read for those who want to improve teaching and learning, okay? Um, I, can't, I can't get deeply into the weeds, but just the idea of visible learning. When John Hattie wrote the book, it was based on 15 years of research. And then, as I said, synthesis of over 800 meta-analyses of the influences on achievement for school-age kids. Now that influences on achievement means what do we do that actually influences learning, okay? And one of the biggest things that came out of that book was something called teacher or collective teacher efficacy. And that idea that when, if teachers believe that I've got a great little quote here. Uh, if teachers, or when, when teachers believe that together they're capable of developing students' critical thinking skills, creativity, or mastery of the content, it happens when teachers believe that and work together on it. So part of what I want to do is actually have a group that all believes we can learn together to improve prove uh, learning in the classroom. Mm. Uh, the second thing, it's a little bit, we're going to go into all this a lot in the course, but um, all of his research is based on a, a concept called effect size. Okay. And in, a, in research methods, you take one experimental group and one control group and find out what the differences are. That's one way to do effect size. But the other way, which is very good for classroom research is um, you measure students' progress. You take a before test and you take a similar, if not the same test as an after test. And you measure, there's a formula to measure how much gain they've made. And that's the effect. The effect is either small, medium, or large. He's taken 150 different things done in the classroom. And so basically, I want to find out, let's not do those things in the classroom that have a very small effect size. Let's do the ones that have large impacts on learning. And that's what I want to workshop with teachers and try to, to figure out. So again, we'll go into that in much more detail about visible learning and effect size, but that's what's kind of connected with that quote. So yes, really looking at impactful learning and teaching. Mm. Um, so Steve, uh, what are you hoping as well that teachers will get from your Gmail course? Um, yeah, so, and? And um, with that question, I think you also can freely expand into how you plan to approach your course. Okay. Um, so certainly everybody's going to learn a lot about doing effect size. And that's a real practical classroom research method. Um, there, we're finding more and more teachers who want to do research or want to try to publish something, but don't really have any idea how to do it. And so this 
this kind of, there are many different kinds of effect size, but this before after measurement is a wonderful tool. Um, I've got another little acronym, see if you can figure it out by the end. Um, the, uh, the first one is that we'll create a little group that will, through this shared experience, whether it's misery loves company or just the, the depth that we go into that will really support each other. I expect to make some really good friends that will last uh, for many years as, as Phil and I have done. Uh, so support. Uh, awareness, right? uh, learning more about what are all those 150 things that he's identified that teachers actually do in the classroom. I think uh, another one word would be validation for mm -hmm. validating all of the things that you do that have this high effect or high impact on learning. And finally, um, all of it's based on evidence. OK, so you'll actually see and be referred to studies and descriptions of studies that show how uh, he came to some of these realizations uh, in in classroom uh influence on learning. Uh, just finally, how do you plan to approach it? Uh, in many of the same ways that Scott, uh, Kevin, and Dorothy have already uh, outlined, I, I, I kind of call it a, a SWAT team. We're, we're a little SWAT team approach that we're all going off into our areas. The whole book is only 194 pages. There are three parts of it and only nine chapters. So I'm basically trying to do the whole thing, okay? Um, what I think I can bring to it is uh, organization and facilitation and lots of ideas for the classroom. And so that's where I, I wanna take this uh, if I can. Okay, Scott, or okay, Phil, back to, I'm usually back to Scott, sorry about that. You can call me Scott if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, it's been a pleasure to hear you share all of that as well. And um, as with the comments in the audience, then it's really resonating with many of us, as with uh, things that have been said by Kevin Scott and Dorothy. And, you know, teachers have also said in the comments about how, you know, this kind of approach to teacher development is one of the reasons why you can also go back and take these same type of courses again and again, because each time you get something else and go deeper with them as well. Um, I'll just give a chance for people to also ask any questions in the comments, uh, sorry, in, yes, in the Facebook comments, in addition to the excellent comments they've been putting in. For anybody who joined um, in um, after the start of the Facebook Live, then uh, yes, to answer your question, you can see this later. The recording will automatically be made available by Facebook uh, shortly after the event. And so it will be there. And Phil, it feels like we've, um, we're, we're not so much over, we're pretty much on time with what we wanted to do, but uh, we're already in. A, it feels like we really want to get into the Zoom room now with everybody. Does that seem okay? Yes, indeed. Um, so I'm just going to unpin you. And I've got the Zoom link. I'll put it, I'll put the Zoom link into Facebook. Is that okay? Brilliant. Thank you very much. So um, just before you do, I was just going to say that. So basically, we are going to invite anyone in the audience who would like to join uh, Scott, Stephen, Kevin and Dorothy. Uh, they will be in four breakout rooms, which you can freely go into uh, to meet and greet them and ask any questions you may have about the course. Uh, those sessions will not be recorded, so it's um, breakout rooms kind of work a bit differently, but also it means that you can ask anything you like comfortably and you won't be necessarily on Facebook and Facebook Live, that's after this session. But and we will invite you during just the tail end of this to actually come in and join us in the Zoom room. Before and we don't, don't feel you have to uh, say something brilliant or ask a riveting question, you can just come in and hang out. Uh, come in and pop around the rooms, hear what other people are saying. We're just happy. It's uh, it, it, Sometimes it's a scary first step to, to come into a Zoom room with people you don't really know, but we're, we're all really friendly, natural, laid back people who would just love to have you come in and, and join us. Yes. Um, how, how long are the Zoom rooms for? Yep. So um, yep. Go ahead. Uh, we plan on having them open for about 15, 20 minutes. And that should be enough time for people to 
ask questions and so forth, but it's not. Yeah, we can't go too late because we're uh, we're at the end of the we're at the beginning of the day for Scott and the end of the day for Dorothy. <laughs> so probably about 15 yes. minutes um, if we have um, people involved. Um, and if not, we'll wrap up quicker and share the video with people. Yes. And so just before we uh, say goodbye here on Facebook, um, then I'll leave Steve with a chance to check for any questions that have come in. And just to say then, you can see the link is in our event page and so forth. Uh, you'll find it under Great Minds in Language Education uh, on, the ITDI face, uh, on the ITDI website as well. Uh, please note that the places are limited up to about 20 people only. So uh, we do have a few select scholarships as well. Uh, we will try to make available for as many teachers as we can. And, but it's important, of course, then to register early to avoid disappointment or missing out. Uh, if you're waiting to, if, to enter the Zoom room, we will let you in in just a moment. So please bear with us in the waiting room. Uh, lastly, I just want to um, give everyone a heads up then uh, for anyone who's signing up for Kevin and Scott's course starting about a month from now, then yes, do uh, check out um, the books early as well. I looked for a different number, uh, a range of different countries around the world for Amazon and noted that while some people may only take two to three days to get their book, it can take up to two weeks, depending upon where you are in the world. So please do be aware of that. Okay, so um, Scott, you put, uh, sorry, Steve, I'm now calling you Scott as well. <laughs> Everybody's Scott. Wait. Uh, so yes, please uh, do feel free to click on the link, uh, join the Zoom room. We will uh, let people in uh, just now as well. And then for everyone who's joined us on Facebook for our live, thank you very much for coming in for all your comments and contributions and questions. Uh, my name's Phil Brown with ITDI and it's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Kevin, Scott, Dorothy and Stephen.